In Hebrews 1 and 1, the writer there beginning in 1 and verse 1 and verse 2 says, God who at many times and in many ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Those who read and study the Bible, one truth holds steady. God has spoken. And in these last days, he speaks to us by his Son, Christ, and the New Testament. The churches of Christ have sought to use this thought as our guiding principle, encouraging people to return to the scriptures and use them alone as our guide in matters of religion and faith. We're living in a time where many have been taught and believe that religious division among Christian churches is a good thing. After all, it gives us choices. But where do those choices come from? Why do they exist? What has been their results? Speaking to the last question, such division in doctrine, creed, beliefs, has led those who believe in Christ to not just be divided in our thoughts, beliefs, and worship, But sadly, we see the influence of Christianity fading, as there exists at this time no true standard by which we follow, no clear right or wrong, if you will. This is by no means the first time God's people have been in such difficult waters. The truths that lead them back before will lead us back to unity and success again if we follow those. I've lived long enough to understand that given enough time, everything old is new again. One of the most controversial statements that we ever find in the scriptures is found in the very first verse of the very first book of the Bible. Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The verses following that statement, dealing with matters of creation and finally of mankind themselves, are no less troublesome to many of the modern thinkers. Yet this is the very place that the Lord required Moses to begin in reestablishing a relationship relationship with the people of Israel. It's the very place that we must also reestablish our relationship with Him. The Lord God is our Creator. We are the created it sets a certain perspective by which we are going to enter into that relationship and enter into our understanding of Him. In Isaiah 45 and verse 9, the writer there says, Woe unto him that striveth with his Maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? You know, it's one thing for us to disagree among ourselves or to argue among ourselves over our various opinions. But it's another thing entirely for the created to ask the creator, What exactly are you doing? While it's nice sometimes that God will explain to us what it is that he's doing and why it is that he does the things that he does and commands us the things that he does. But this relationship of the creator and the created puts us in a position of submission and subjection to the greater. This is a troublesome thought and a troublesome idea that we will look at as we go through today's lesson. 
In the book of Isaiah 64, 6, the writer there says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and consumed us because of our iniquities. You know, there's a great difference also between the Creator and the created. The struggle sometimes of just who does God think he is, or why do people want to believe in God, has led us to believe that if we deny God, if we deny his existence, if we refuse to allow the scriptures and the Bible into government or everyday life, if we can just jam and cram Christianity off into a corner somewhere, everything will be better because we can do it better than any concept of God. But the truth of the matter is, when we look at the laws that we legislate and we see the results of many of those laws, we have to acknowledge what Isaiah says. As righteous as we seem to think we are, all of our righteousness equates to filthy rags. We don't succeed and we don't have great success in our ideas of what is moral and right and best are nowhere near those that are revealed in the scriptures. Yet many of those in authority and places of authority do not want you, do, want, do not want me to consider those ideas of right and wrong. They would rather say that they're rather antiquated and we have to move on. But the truth of the matter is man has always been the same. We might dress a little different. We might talk a little different. But when we look at our societies and relationships and all of those things, man has not changed much since the time of his creation. Isaiah, Isaiah 64 and 8 says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou art the potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. How much greater and better it would be if we could stop dividing and arguing with one another, stop denying the existence of God, and could acknowledge that he is the potter and we're the clay. He's the one who's worked us and made us that we could speak in regards to God, such as Isaiah 64, 9. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. What a wonderful thing it would be if we could go back to the scriptures and accept the fact that we are all the people of God. We are all the created of his hands. Life does not exist because we deem it possible. Life exists because God created us as defined in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. But one of the things that we find in the scriptures that so many people struggle with is that idea of religion and morality and right and wrong and all of these things. We don't want to live up to the fact that we are a people whose decisions have led us into many difficult and troublesome situations. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 3, Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot say, neither is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, 
Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. And the result of that, as we see even in our present day, Isaiah 59, 4 says, None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Read your local paper. Watch the news. See if these things are not so, even on this very day. Troublesome times, difficult times, the murdering, the killings, the things that we read about, the thefts, the drug problems, all of these things, sadly, we have brought upon ourselves. They didn't just materialize from nowhere. They are the products of our hands and our misguided selves. Psalm 14, a psalm that is said to be of David, provided to the chief musician, beginning in verse 1, says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? There were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. You know, we fight with the idea of the existence of God. We fight with the idea of the authority of God and the authority of his scriptures. But if we would give ourselves back to the things of God, if we would begin to once again speak where the Bible speaks, to uphold the things that the Bible teaches, the things especially that have been revealed to us in the new covenant, we could rejoice once again in the things of God. Those who reject and, and resist the things of God are very quick to go back to the Old Testament and to laws that pertain to the people of Israel and those of uh, days preceding Christianity and looking at some of those laws and upholding those and say, do you really want to go back to that? But we understand that the New Testament is our guide in matters of faith and religion today. That's why it's the New Testament, and that's why there's an Old Testament, because when there is a New Testament, whatever existed prior to that becomes old. The Hebrew writer speaks to those things. Romans 1 and verse 20 talks about an understanding of God's existence. You know, throughout the world, throughout all nations, throughout all places, as archaeologists go and as they dig up and they see paintings on the walls, as they try to understand, one thing holds true. Throughout all of the nations, throughout all of time past, there has been a knowledge of a deity or deities, those who have reigned and ruled over us, who have created us and guided us from the very beginning. Now, the knowledge and understanding of those things and how they recorded those things and, and what they believed about those things may vary. But the truth of the matter is, throughout generations of time, all the way back as far as we can go, we find that mankind believed in a God. And therefore, we believe that we were created. 
that someone other than ourselves created us and placed us here on this earth. And as such, we are subject to that authority, whoever that is. And revealed in the New Testament and the Old Testament, it is the God who revealed himself to Israel through Moses and on Mount Sinai, who sent his Son into the world, who revealed him once again unto us, in the New Testament, Paul said in Romans 1.20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but become vain in their own imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds, four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul, a very wise man, having a very good understanding of the history, not only of the Jewish people, but of the Gentiles and the nations around him, understood very well the history of mankind. Obviously, in the beginning, we understood and knew who God was. He revealed himself to us. And the evidence today still continues in all the creation around us that there is something, someone, if you will, far greater than the things that we can see, feel, touch, smell, with our own senses, that there must be something greater that brought us to this point. Using the philosophy and the idea of merely millions and billions of years can't possibly explain everything that exists, the very nature of mankind and our understanding of our very existence. What we conclude is what the Apostle Paul concludes as we look at the various beliefs and ideas that have manifested themselves throughout the ages and around the world. Sometimes mankind chooses not to retain the truth of God in their memory. They want to serve themselves, that is, the creature, with its own lusts and desires more than the Creator. And so giving in to their lusts and their desires, they allow themselves to be led astray, worshiping in essence their own wants and wishes, rather than to give credit to a Creator who's made them. Modern science and education teaches us that everything came from somewhere. The only principal explanation for all that we see around us is billions of years and something from something else. Modern science and modern thinking always require something, but that something they refuse to acknowledge ultimately is God. But when they're asked, what was that very first something? You can be sure there will be no real, clear, definite answer. Lots of theories, which, by the way, will also be lacking in an explanation that, in the beginning, God. In truth, modern science needs a creation to answer where the first spark of existence came from. Without an explanation of where that first spark of existence came from, 
as we say, they are only left to keep going back another billion, another billion, another billion. Thus, even the Big Bang itself requires something to work with. You can't have a Big Bang without something that will explode. Thus, even the Big Bang must have something. Here's a truth that caused this discussion to, to find its true foundation. If there is a God and there was a creation, then God has a right to dictate how we act and what is expected of us. He also has a right to hold us accountable to himself and cause us to answer for him. And this means in matters of science, religion, morality, and yes, even government. Our government wants to hide the concept of God because in many ways government wants to present itself as the savior of mankind. But I'm sorry, the savior of mankind job has already been taken when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is why God started out in Genesis 1 and 1 before he delivered the Ten Commandment law through Moses to the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. Before they asked the question, just who does this God think he is, that we should live up to these commandments he's given us? Moses started with Genesis 1 and 1 and explained why God had a right to tell them they should have no other gods before. Why they should honor their mother and father. Why they should not lie and steal and cheat and do all the things that the law of Moses said. It's the very reason why in explaining the gospel of Christ and who he was, before John even explained what Jesus did in his day and the cross of Calvary, he explained who Jesus was in the beginning. John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. When faced with rules and authority, the first question seems to be, who are you to tell me what to do? And so God answers that. When we pick up the Bible and read Genesis 1 and 1, we're told just who God is. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Before John explains who the Savior was, he explains who he really is and always has been, John 1 and 1. Deuteronomy 4 and 1, Moses told Israel concerning the statutes and the judgments which were given that they should hearken, O Israel, that you may live. Moses called the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 5 and 1, and said, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn them and keep and do them. The Bible ex exists to tell us who God is and what he's done and to explain to us the things that we need to do in matters of faith, religion, in matters of day-to-day -day life, in matters of government, science, and many more things. God is our creator he is the one who the Apostle Paul says, uh, quoting from the Greeks on Mars Hill in Acts 17, he is the one in whom we live, move, and have our very being. The New Testament today does not speak to us of our coming out of bondage in Egypt, 
but rather of our coming out from under the bondage of sin and death through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Romans 6, 17 says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being they then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Later on in 6.23 of Romans, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, why not start out this new year, this new opportunity to seek out the things of God, why not make this the day that you and your family make a decision to know more about God's plan for your lives? Why not seek out the Church of Christ in your community and attend one of the worship times or Bible studies? God's gift of salvation is truly worth finding and knowing. May God bless and keep you in His grace as we walk together in His truth. And remember, as always, the Churches of Christ salute you. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.